Well, welcome. It's so nice to be back in this building. And I mean, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, as probably looking at all your faces, you all know the history of the 300 Committee, um, which was founded by a small group of people who thought it would be a good idea to give a gift to the town of Falmouth on the tricentennial. And um, that um, was 38 years ago. So we've been uh, in business for a while and grown. And we are actually up to um, preserving about 2,500 acres now, in, just in the town of Falmouth. Our mission is to permanently preserve and protect open space. And we've been doing that. I see a lot of um, volunteer land stewards here. Thank you very much, because you're doing the protection part. <laughs> we really appreciate everybody's hard work. And um, if you're a member, which I think all of you are, I'm pretty sure, thank you for being a member. Our membership um, donations really keep our little engine running strong. And we've been doing, I'm really proud of the work we've been doing. I'm, I can't be shy about it. <laughs> um, I did want to um, thank um, members of our outreach committee, Marcy, Dina, thank you for the cookies, <laughs> and Anne Marie, where is she? And Allison, who is recording. Oh, Stephanie just came in, yay. And um, Allison's going to be recording for FPCB, so thank you. And before I um, <coughs> go any further, I do want to tell you if you haven't gone over to the Art Center, the Art Center, um, and it's, this is the week to go. Um, although till the 27th, the old ladies against underwater garbage have a um, art exhibit. It's not real big, but it's it definitely there's a message there, and they have turned the um, garbage and trash, etc., that they have collected into art. And honestly, it's very very fun and sort of sad, but it's, it really is great. So the um, OLA members <laughs> have done this, and I, I really encourage you to go over. Allison and I popped in there yesterday, and it was really fun. And if you take, if you have grandchildren or young children, they have a scavenger hunt set up. So you can do a scavenger, kids can do a scavenger hunt, um, finding the trash in the art. It's really quite clever. So. With that, I'd like to introduce Allison and uh, Allison Leshy, fabulous volunteer for everybody. <laughs> and well, let's and I will introduce our speaker, Kristen. So, Kristen Andres is the uh, associate director for education for the Association uh, to Preserve Cape Cod, or APCC, uh, and it is our region's. Uh, environmental advocacy nonprofit organization. If you're not already a member, I'll put a plug in for them. So yes. you the trouble, but yeah, they really do great, great work. Um, and before joining APCC as a staff member, she worked for the town of Chatham as its first conservation agent for more than 15 years. Uh, Kristen serves on several boards and committees, including Ecological Landscape Alliance, Chatham Friends of Trees, Friends of Chatham Waterways, and the Pollinator Pathway Cape Cod Steering Committee. She's the regional liaison for Grow Native Massachusetts and an honorary trustee of the Chatham Conservation Foundation. She writes a bi-weekly column for the Cape Cod Chronicle on natural history topics. Kristen describes herself as slightly obsessed with observing and photographing pollinators, plants, and other wild <laughs> critters. She's a native plant enthusiast, promoting the use of native plants in the landscape whenever possible. And I will, on a personal note, say that um, Kristen was my inspiration for ripping out large parts of our lawn and replacing it with, um, with native plants. We live on a pond, and um, you know, APCC puts out on their Facebook page a continual stream of really great, very inspirational um, information about how to do that and different kinds of native plants and the benefits um, that it brings. Um, she introduced me to Doug Talmy, who I don't know if we'll talk about him and make him a groupie of his. Um, so I really, kudos to you. You definitely have a convert and hopefully after tonight you'll, you'll have some more. So thank you very much for being here. 
Also, I would be remiss to um, not introduce Susie Halstrick to this art. I know she's so modest, but she pulls it all together for all of this, everything we do. And also, they're beautiful. Um, there's beautiful um, brochures and um, things from APCC out on, on the table out there, too. So help yourself. Lovely information. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to be here this evening, and thank you for coming out. I joked with Allison earlier, and she knows I'm a morning person. She and I often uh, email each other uh, before the sun is up. <laughs> so to be here this evening, I, I appreciate all of you um, coming to, to listen to this presentation. Um, how to love your pond. Gosh, our ponds are so special to us. and. Um, I think um, I'm hoping that I can give you some takeaways tonight of things that you can do to um, take better care of your pond uh, or help other folks uh, make some better choices about how to care for their pond. So many years ago when I was a conservation agent in Chatham, um, I did some outreach programming and it was around freshwater ponds and this title came to me, The Jewels of Cape Cod, our freshwater ponds, and at the time I thought it was a little too corny, uh, but I went with it anyway and uh, 20 years later it's, uh, we're still using it. Um, because it's really true, if you look at uh, Cape Cod from above, and uh, look down at all those little red, uh, not red, but blue shining spots. They're like uh, the jewels of our, our little sand spit here. According to the Cape Cod Commission's uh, updated pond atlas, we have 890 freshwater ponds on Cape Cod. It's wow. pretty incredible, 890. We used to say 996, but when they went back to update the pond atlas, they applied some different um, criteria um, some of the smaller ponds, they decided weren't any ponds anymore, they were more like wetlands. So, uh, but the number is still pretty significant, 890. A lot of our ponds look like this from above. This is a sweet little pond in Brewster called Dollar Pond. Obviously this is a drone shot. If I didn't tell you it was a pond, you might think it was just a little puddle surrounded by lichens. Think about it in mosses. Um, I just absolutely adore this photo in particular, but um, a lot of our ponds are these kettle hole ponds that don't have stream inlets or outlets. They're really isolated depressions in the landscape, which does make them very special. This is the same pond in springtime. Now, quite exactly uh, the same position, but you get the idea. So our, our kettle ponds, the uh, majority of our ponds really respond to precipitation and to the level of groundwater because most of them are connected to groundwater. So in uh, dry years or in late summer, uh, when we've had a, kind of a, a dry summer, you can um, uh, expect that the water line is going to drop. And so this would be at the end of the summer in this particular little pond. Um, this golden perp is what you see flowering. Otherwise, that would have been submerged in the earlier part of the year or in a high water year, it would be submerged. Where you see the bare sand areas, if you were standing there looking at it, you'd see little depressions where the uh, pumpkin seeds or sunfish had, um, had scoured out a little area to lay eggs. Um, the vegetation is um, very different when it's um, low water like this. But that precipitation, um, rain, and our level of our groundwater does impact many of our ponds. And we call them coastal plain ponds. And typically, their characteristics are that they have sandy or gravelly uh, substrate. And they have that seasonal fluctuation in ground, with the groundwater levels. And they often can have a globally threatened habitat of coastal plain pond shore plant community. If we're lucky to see these, uh, I have been lucky to have witnessed them and to know where some of them are in my part of the, uh, Cape Cod. And they look like this in late summer. This is Goose Pond in Chatham. 
And what you see flowering there um, pretty prolifically is Plymouth gentian, it's a rare species. There's also rose tick seed that you can't really make out because it's a very dainty, tiny flower. But as you see, it's kind of like, uh, we call it zonation of vegetation, but it's really like a bathtub ring. So notice this is obviously low water. This is late in the season, August or September. Uh, the water line would ordinarily on an average day be up more where the shrub line is on an average year or during the high, part, high water year part of the season. So when we have these low water years, which, which my experience again in the last couple of decades was, used to be like every five years we have a low water year. Not has, hasn't really been the case recently. We've had uh, several years of drought. But in any event, um, when we've got um, these little plants survive, they're submerged, they could be submerged for again up to five years or more. Now, uh, waiting for the low water year to happen or for a, a droughty summer. And then the substrate becomes um, um, exposed and then they're able to, to grow and flower. Very delicate little plants. This is another wonderful little shoreline. If you know your plants, you probably can pick out some things. There's wool grass there, there's common bone set. Uh, there is some rose tick seed on the far right corner. Again, very tiny little tiny pink rosettes. Um, and uh, this is just another lovely uh, stretch. There is some Plymouth gentian here I know too, uh, when I've seen it before. Um, these areas, our shorelines and the upland beyond them is an extremely important transitional area, not only for the diversity of plants that want to grow here, uh, that are native, but also for the creatures that make use of these um, transitional areas from the upland to the pond and from the pond to the upland. And just as some examples, snapping turtles. Uh, most of our ponds are going to have these wonderful snapping turtles that uh, live for so many years and spend their life in the pond, but need to, those females are going to come out of the pond and uh, find somebody's backyard, but they're gonna need to move up those ponds, the slopes around the pond uh, to find a soft area to lay her eggs. And on the far right there is a little stink pot or a musk turtle, sweet little turtles. Um, they need the upland around the pond to overwinter. They're gonna find a log to overwinter under, um, but will spend their summers in the pond eating algae and other things. So picture yourself on a hot summer day and this, uh, and you just walk down the trail to this little pond. It's a wonderful little place. You're probably going to hear some puddling over to the left and it's gonna be a cat bird that's uh, taking a bath in a little uh, open area of water. You're gonna hear the osprey overhead that's uh, had just flown off a branch as it's looking to fish, uh, find a fish in this pond. Just behind the blueberry bush is where that catbird was taking a bird bath. And there's going to be a lot of things flying around head, uh, around your head and noises, uh, insect noises. And there's going to be button bush flowering. And of course, we have all sorts of creatures that make use of our ponds. Uh, our damselflies and dragonflies, they're in the, their first part of their life cycle is in the water as uh, very voracious eaters, and uh, when they do emerge, they still are voracious eaters, and they're going to be eating mosquitoes uh, on the wing and other flying insects. Our shoreline vegetation is so important. It holds the soils. Uh, the natural vegetation slows the rainwater as it falls down those steep slopes to the cattle ponds, uh, helps absorb any nutrients. Um, Obviously, it provides a wonderful habitat for all sorts of creatures and cover. Here, um, well, we've got you know, trees falling into the pond for those sunning spots for painted turtles, uh, or maybe it's where the kingfisher is gonna land. The vegetation um, here, so we've got grass leaf goldenrod, and uh, I think there's some, um, some mint in there, and switchgrass. So very important, these natural vegetated areas around ponds. And this is a recent um, study that I just became aware of, although it's not new, 
But fish found in lakes with undeveloped lake shores are healthier than those lakes that are developed. Kind of intuitive. But what they found was um, terrestrial insects comprise up to 100% of the diet of fish in undeveloped lakes. And where uh, we've got developed areas, uh, a maximum of 2% uh, uh, makes up their diet. So that's a pattern that was apparent at the regional and also national scale. So these natural native vegetation around the pond uh, is producing insects that fall into the lake. Um, and if you're a fisherman, you know, you know, beetles, flies, I mean, whatever, the, there's uh, certain insects that you know the fish are gonna go after. So they are used to eating insects dropping in from the lake, I mean, from the vegetation around the pond. And that's because native plants and our insects have co-evolved together and they have very complex relationships. They're, uh, the survival of their species, uh, plant and insect, uh, are integral to each other. The monarch butterfly is always the classic example because monarch butterfly caterpillars can only eat milkweed. They can't eat any other plant. They won't survive in any other plant. Mm -hmm. That's just one example of a a vast uh, array of relationships that I don't think we even can comprehend and uh, we've only scratched the surface of understanding. And as Allison mentioned, Doug Talamy is, is the entomologist from the University of Delaware who's done a lot of work looking at uh, the value of native plants to our insects and um, particular, in particular Lepidoptera and moths and butterflies. And we call them host plants. Um, other insects also use host plants, but it's um, uh, when we talk about butterflies and moths, these are a couple of examples. The spicebush swallowtail, she is going to lay her egg on spicebush and sassafras. Nothing else will do. So if you don't have sassafras and you don't have spicebush, you're not going to see that uh, butterfly. Same with the eastern swallowtail, a little bit broader diet. We'll look at uh, the wild black cherry that a lot of us think is weedy, but actually um, it's a host plant, um, probably for more insects than just the eastern swallowtail, are birches, birches and tulip trees. And in fact, more than 90% of moths and butterflies require native plants. Their caterpillars are very, have uh, figured out how to, um, how to uh, eat plants that don't want to be eaten this is why the example of the monarch butterfly is so easy to understand because the, the caterpillar, the um, milkweed um, has some very toxic chemicals in it that make it distasteful. Plants don't want to be eaten, um, but they, um, the monarch caterpillar has figured out the workaround and chemically and is able to digest it. And so it's similar with all of these other plants and insects. They've just kind of figured out this cooperative way to coexist. This is a little difficult to read, I guess, but in 1971, uh, Maine legislature passed the Mandatory Shoreline Zoning Act, and the current law, as amended, requires municipalities to establish land use controls for all land within 250 feet of ponds. Think about Massachusetts and your town, 250 feet. And a Vermont study of uh, found that this indeed um, made it possible to have development on, on a lakeshore while protecting the aquatic habitat uh, and biota. Vermont um, has a pretty extensive um, program looking at um, lakeshore, protecting their lakes, and they come up with a lot of guidelines, and I thought this one was um, quite interesting. Um, vegetative buffers. So again, that vegetation is so important around our ponds. Probably can't read this from where you are, but um, this is, these are the guidelines that they're providing their citizens. They believe that to have a, a stable shoreline, you have to have at least 15 feet of naturalized vegetative buffer. And 250 would be better. You need at least 25 feet um, a vegetative buffer to provide habitat, but 250 would be better. 
Um, and as we go down um, the line, the birds and the salamanders and the turtles need a whole lot more. So the very last ones there, the turtles, the snakes, and the frogs, well, it would be good to have at least three to 400 feet of vegetative buffer, a thousand or more is even better. So just think about the ponds that you know and uh, you know how much, uh, maybe what's lacking there as far as vegetative buffers. <clears throat> so now we all know what we love about ponds, but now I'm gonna talk about the bad stuff and then we'll um, hopefully we'll be able to give you some answers as to how we can help um, address the threats to our ponds. So this is along that pond that I showed um, the turtle log and all that nice vegetation. This is what happens when folks love their pond too much. This is a town pond. Um, this is not a swimming pond. This is where uh, it was originally the land was given so that people could go and fish. Um, but it became so popular. The kids knew it was a great place to go. Nobody can see you there. And um, basically they trampled the heck out of the shoreline. So the only thing that's left is the switchgrass, which, you know, switchgrass is pretty sturdy. But um, all of that other delicate vegetation is, has been obliterated. Uh, the far further up where they didn't feel like walking any further, there's still vegetation along that stretch of shoreline. But trampling of the, our pond shorelines can be, is just very detrimental to uh, vegetation, particularly those delicate little Plymouth gentian and others. And also, you know, remember we, as we lose vegetation around our ponds, we're losing the habitat for those insects that then end up in the pond. Um, so I couldn't find the exact uh, place where I found this. I know it was from somebody who did a presentation from Vermont, but 40% of the food proteins for fish is from those insects that drop from the native vegetation around the pond. This is another thing that happens around our ponds, which is also detrimental to all that vegetation. And um, this is winter. These boats are here at this particular pond uh, all year round. Um, no place for that stink pot to go and find a plate, find a log to crawl under. Um, so this is a poor management um, activity around our ponds. Aquatic invasives. This is a scary one. Um, <coughs> this is the list of invasives in Massachusetts. Now, fortunately, some of these are not here on the Cape yet like zebra mussels. I hope they never come here, but there's a darn good chance um, just because people, I'm sure there's folks who go to New Hampshire and New York State and all other sorts of places with their boats and then come to their place on the Cape or come vacation on the Cape. Um, and that's how these things get passed around for the most part. They're, they're hiding in trailers, on boats, uh, in the bilge. Um, Sometimes invasives get introduced by, oh, let's let the goldfish and the aquarium creatures into the pond and they dump the aquarium. My niece did that years ago, not in Cape Cod. Um, and like any family member, they didn't listen to me. <laughs> I was making my niece feel bad by the fact that she did that. But indeed, that's what happens. A lot of this um, vegetation is stuff that we use in aquariums. And once it gets into um, these unique situations, it takes over and um, cause all sorts of problems, really difficult problems. Um, one of the, there's three at the bottom of the list here, potential invaders. And I'll note the very last one, water hyacinth. Anybody here have a fish pond that you've created? For people who create fish ponds, Maybe for koi, um, hyacinths are something that you buy to keep the water clean and they're very pretty and they usually die out in the winter. But a lot of the reason this is a potential invader is just think with climate change and warming temperatures, think about your own perennial garden, how many annuals that you planted last year or years in the past still come back. They don't really die in the winter anymore. So as uh, the climate warms, a lot of plants um, that are not native and that are gonna wreak havoc can get a foothold. So um, don't buy water hyacinths <laughs> to put in your fish ponds. Um, 
particularly if your fish ponds are, are close. I remember um, years ago there was somebody who insisted on putting, they just wanted to put a frog pond in, but it was right next to a freshwater pond because they wanted it to blend in. And I kept thinking if anything, you know, non-native goes in there, it's very easily gonna hop over to the, the natural pond. So these are the signs that go up when you have an infestation. And it's just really important if you've got um, boating equipment, maybe it's even a paddle board or <clears throat> any kind of, any kind of uh, recreational toys, um, including um, boats and trailers, but to make sure that they're washed and dry and that you check for everything um, before you um, go, you know, go into another pond or lake. Um, yeah. So we all know this invasive species, Phragmites. It's everywhere. It's along our coastlines. It's uh, taking a foothold in some of our freshwater ponds. I've seen this um, on a pond in Chatham. Again, we've got that those that lovely coastal plain pond shore vegetation, and once Phragmites gets in there, you can imagine how easily it's going to squeeze it out and destroy it. And this is why Phragmites is so good at what it does. You might think that that little branch is dead, but if you look closely, there is a sprout coming out of it. Each little nodule has the ability to start a root, and so it's very aggressive in um, Sp spreading by its roots, um, it also will spread by, by seed. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. On a freshwater pond, if it even shows up, um, it really needs to be controlled as soon as possible. So this is a picture from Susan Bauer. You might know Susan. She's one of the old log founder, right? And uh, she sent me this picture not for the reason I like it. She sent it because she doesn't like it the dogs. These dogs were bothering her when she was swimming, but I just think it was an adorable photo. Because <laughs> who doesn't like to see those chessies and those two little pups there watching the adults swim? I just love it. But when you take dogs to a pond, if you've got dogs, you know what happens. You need to clean up after them. Um, otherwise, you can get bacterial contamination, and that's um, not good for other swimmers, and it'll close swimming beaches. Um, but there's a great solution for that. If you've got a Muppet program in town, that's awesome. It's great for neighborhoods too. If you got a neighborhood association and maybe there's somebody who doesn't quite get it yet that they should be picking up their dog poop, you know, get your neighborhood association to, to put up a few Muppet dispensers around. Um, Agway was sponsoring um, the program for quite a while. I think they still do. This is a new scourge on ponds that I have, it's a pet peeve of mine. Swim floats, we have swim floats everywhere and um, maybe it's just a sign of the times that we're all getting older, but um, clearly this swim float has seen better days, but you have to notice the blue styrofoam beneath it. This is what the problem is. This is the new microplastic pollution in our freshwater ponds and our coastal waterways because this is how all of the floats were, have been made for many years. But the styrofoam is disintegrating, it breaks into tiny pieces. Uh, if it's um, dragged across the beach, or uh, even just critters poking at it, or ice, or any debris, um, it e easily starts disintegrating. So this has become a huge uh, to my mind, it's a huge issue that has a very easy solution, and it's just um, sometimes people just need to know that there's a better way um, to take care of their float. So this is a, another <laughs> horrible photo. This is Chatham, um, but I've seen it in Sandwich, and you probably um, have seen it uh, yourselves. So look at all that blue on the beach. Um, and in the sweet little pipe board there, the tiny, if you know pipe board, it's very small. So those are very tiny pieces. This is not like you're gonna be able to go and pick that up. Um, it's in the system. And there's the problem right there. You can see the dilapidated float in the water. Chatham has passed a, a, a bylaw regulating that um, people are obligated to upgrade their floats. 
when they um, before they get their chapter 10a permit from the harbor master in our town the harbor master regulates all floating permits even in our freshwater ponds uh, the problem is it's still not so easy to enforce and uh, town staff has been sort of slow to take action they don't feel that they've got a, a legal stance to say that float in the center of the pond is the cause of this debris and pollution on the shoreline um, i don't know i don't think it's a stretch but um, it's it's a difficult uh, enforcement thing to do. So I really think it's more about outreach and letting people know that there are other options out there. Uh, this is what the option is. It's encapsulated styrofoam. There's still flotation in there, but it's encapsulated um, with hard <coughs> plastic. So you, you don't have any, um, it's the black tanks below there. Um, so there isn't a, the ability for that um, styrofoam to break off into little pieces. So and, um, there are other things that happen to our ponds that aren't quite as obvious as uh, turquoise styrofoam breaking up. Uh, in a natural environment, aquatic plants receive input of nutrients from the water um, that flows off the land. It carries with it soil and partic particles that contribute to an accumulation of sediment. And the aquatic vegetation then thrives in the water, in the water body, um, tends to fill in. This is a natural normal process but um, it takes thousands of years for this to happen and this is called eutrophication we're seeing it much more quickly now eutrophication is accelerated because because of us because of what we do with the land um, what we're putting into the land and how how we're treating the shorelines around our ponds and and our watershed part of it is this um, Sorry, the slide is cut off there. It looks okay on my computer. Um, this is a map showing the areas that are sewered on Cape Cod and those open space. There's some light green areas that show the open space that's protected and the rest of the brown are those areas that are developed and that rely on septic systems. We know that our wastewater is detrimental to the quality in our coastal embayments no doubt it's um, affecting our pond water quality as well with excess nutrients. But I just think that this um, map that we have in our State of the Waters report uh, really illustrates um, how we're all so dependent on septic systems and that our sewering is um, pretty limited. On Cape Cod, nearly 6 million pounds of fertilizers and 1.3 million pounds of pesticides are applied annually. And before you blame it all on the golf courses, 80% of it, more than 80% is due to residential use. Yeah, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? And then there's stormwater. So here's the other thing that can help uh, contribute to eutrophication with those excess nutrients. Our stormwater, um, is part of that problem. Wastewater, fertilizer use, and stormwater. Most of us don't think about stormwater too much unless you're an engineer, or it's your business, you work for DPW, or you've got a stormwater problem on your own property, then you're probably more keenly aware of uh, why stormwater is an issue. We take care of it because it's a safety issue on roads like this. Um, it can damage our properties, but it also contributes to poor water quality. The old way of dealing with stormwater was just to convey it away. Just get rid of it. Get it off the road from a safety standpoint. Get it away from my house. But this is the old way uh, as an example right here. This is a road in my neighborhood. Um, it is a sloping road, as you see there. And as far as you can see into the picture and as far back um, behind the camera that's upslope, Every time it rains, all the water that hits that surface area ends up in this uh, little channel over here on the left that's paved with asphalt, and it goes down into a lowland area, which is a wetland. Uh, there's a driveway up there in the top right that's a very steeply sloping driveway. All the rain that hits that driveway and any other driveway that's upslope of the road, all of that water comes down in one big, dirty slug of water in one spot. This is how we used to manage our stormwater, and it's not good enough anymore. And in fact, you may even know uh, 
personally of places where you've seen water like this go directly into a surface water like a pond or the ocean. Um, we are, towns are, you know, making efforts to clean these areas up, but often these things are on private roads and they're the last things to be taken care of. So if you live in a pond or a neighborhood that's in a watershed to a pond, this is something to be really keenly aware about uh, because we need to take better care of our stormwater. This is what happens when you don't have stormwater controls. Uh, there's a road above the slope there and the erosion over the bank ends up in the pond, which is off of the photo here down uh, to the right. It erodes away the soil and um, all of that sediment ends up in the pond. Now we know naturally that's something that happens and that that's, uh, but talk about accelerated eutrophication, that's a lot of sand uh, and soil ending up in the pond. And of course, it does nothing good for the trees here. This is uh, another um, maintenance issue with stormwater. The old way is again to, if we're not diverting it into a pond, we're just capturing it into one big uh, hole in the ground. But when it's covered with leaves and um, there's loads of sediment there because it hasn't been maintained, it's not functioning very well. And an overflow of this catch basin could easily impact, um, you know, be diverted somewhere else down, um, going to a pond or, or someone's property for that matter. So maintenance of these uh, systems is still really important. So this is an example of a private neighborhood and um, they have a stormwater, uh, their stormwater is going into a, a little system here on the left. They know it's there because they've decorated it for Christmas. Uh, but unfortunately, they don't really get what it's for or that they need to maintain it. So this is a, you know, it's designed to get the sediment out, but you can see the, the box is full. That has not been cleaned out in many, many years. And what's happening in a big storm event is that it's immediately then overflowing and it has gouged out the vegetation um, around the edge of the pond. <clears throat> so if you live in a neighborhood with private roads and the town's not taking, you know, it's not their responsibility to take care of stormwater, you need to be aware of these things. Um, encourage your neighborhood association to undertake regular stormwater uh, maintenance and add it to the budget. And no association likes to pay money, but this is really important because I'm sure these ponds, there's a pond on either side of this uh, roadway we just looked at, and I'm sure those ponds are really important to that neighborhood. And pursue stormwater improvement projects. Um, green infrastructure, which incorporates um, best practices using native plants to help take up nutrients before the water gets into the pond. So something more than just what you see here with the um, catching the sediment. And you should know that stormwater flows over lawns just because there's something growing here. Lawns are very poor acceptors or receptors of stormwater particularly when they're sloping like this. Lawns tend to get compacted, they get thatch. Um, after, when it rains, and particularly in a heavy uh, rain burst, the water's just gonna sheet off of the lawn and carry with, it, carry with it any kind of fertilizers or pesticides that might have been applied to it. And the goal is really to keep water on the site. That's what we wanna do. That's the best practice. This is the other, um, unfortunate thing that could be improved upon is lawn right up to the edge of the road. So as the stormwater sheets off of the lawn, it's heading right down onto the road and it's heading right down the hill and you know, down the hill there's wetlands and salt marsh. So um, this is less than ideal. So here the solution would be to um, remove some of that lawn along the roadway or you know, planting bed, something to help intercept that water. Um, maybe it's a raised bed and again, just to keep the rainwater on the, on, the, on the land, on the property. Because when we have too many nutrients, we see pictures like this. This is not Cape Cod. Does anybody know what this is? Does it look familiar? <laughs> One of the Great Lakes. You're right, yeah. Yep, this is Lake Erie. And um, that uh, beautiful blue-green is cyanobacteria. Ooh. 
um, if you recall back in, I think it was 2014, the town of Toledo lost the use of their drinking water, which is Lake Erie, and the reason their drinking water was no longer potable at that moment was because of the severe cyanobacteria blooms, and they, had to, um, they didn't have any treatment for it at the time. Now, the reason Lake Erie is uh, impacted so heavily, and particularly in this part of the, of the lake, uh, is because of nutrient runoff, but in their case, it's agricultural runoff. It's animal farms, um, and uh, just a plug for Save the Date, uh, May 11th, we're going to show the Erie situation at Cape Cinema, and that is um, going to be about this whole issue here, and be able to talk about, have a panel discussion after and talk about the, um, the similarities and differences with what we're experiencing. This is what our cyanobacteria blooms look like on Cape Cod. They all look a little bit different. This one was extremely impressive. This is Harwich in the West Reservoir. Um, I, the color scheme and everything I thought was very impressive, but um, also sad at the same time. This is Santuit. So how can we reduce our nutrient um, contribution in the landscape? This is one of the um, examples from the Vermont guidance, which I thought was great. Um, some of the things that are really important would be to, number one, skip those lawn treatments. Uh, no lawn company, no Scott steps, and just embrace the Cape Cod lawn. Cape Cod lawn did well for centuries here. <laughs> And um, I think the more people that know that a Cape Cod lawn is okay to have because we live on Cape Cod, I think we'll all be better off for it. A path to the pond should be angled or serpentine. Um, if you have a, a path that goes straight down to the pond, what an easy shoot for water and erosion. So best to, to um, waggle it back and forth, make an S-curve or whatever, uh, reduce lawn, and plant more native species, try to restore some of that um, natural native vegetation that those insects like, and the wildlife um, that depend on that transitional area. So enhance and preserve that natural buffer. If you do have some wild areas, try to retain those. Um, but you can plant more natives back, and you can make it attractive and make it a garden. And here's Allison's backyard. I just Yay. love what she's yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> So she's been, they've been busily planting more native plants uh, for pollinators and to increase this buffer. Uh, I think that's a lovely tupelo on the left there. Is yeah, that those are, that's those been there? there. <laughs> yeah, but beautiful and yeah. wonderful that they've been retained. And so this is just a perfect example. Again, trying to achieve that um, no stormwater runoff, that zero stormwater runoff from your property. So one example of something you might uh, consider doing is installing a rain garden. Uh, the stormwater on the upland from a pond, you know, comes from what hits the lawn maybe and rolls down, but it's also all the other hard things, our patios and our roofs. Your, um, if your house was built in the last uh, couple of decades, you probably have downspouts to dry wells. Dry wells don't last forever, and they also may be too close to your foundation. Um, these are a rain garden is a nice alternative, and it also can be a wonderful garden feature, um, landscape feature. A rain garden is really just a depression, a garden that's a depression, and it captures the stormwater from your gutter downspout, so you would just direct the water there. Make sure that um, you use native plants so that you can support wildlife as well. And it's really about keeping the water on the site and allowing it to slope, soak slowly into the ground so that the nutrients can be taken up and uh, anything, any particulates that have fallen on the roof that are in the water can get bound up instead of ending up right in the drain. There are lots of rain garden examples. We've, uh, APCC has been fortunate to have some grant money to do some projects. This is Sturgis Library in Barnstable. You wouldn't know it's a rain garden, uh, although the heron looks pretty happy there. That might <laughs> intimate there's some rain water somewhere there. There's a gutter downspout in the far corner there, uh, and there's a couple of pipes at daylight that you don't even see. This is a shade garden, a shady rain garden, so we have lots of ferns and a sweet pepper bush. 
There's also one at the Pituit Library, and we the first one we put in was at the Osterville Library, but I'm not sure with maintenance what's happened there. The other thing you can do to keep stormwater on your property, where you have to have hard surfaces, an asphalt alternative is um, something like what we've done. This is called Porous Pave. Uh, there are different, I'll show you some different examples, but we put in porous pave as a um, green infrastructure um, material to demonstrate um, how with this surfacing, the water will flow right through it. So what, whereas our driveway that we inherited, when the water comes off of 6A, it shoots down that driveway and it goes back, I'd say about 150 feet. Um, it's just amazing once it picks up speed, how far it goes into the property. Our porous pave, we don't get puddles. They're, it's, it's meant to uh, infiltrate the water. And the key to it is, um, just as this uh, alternative, this is percrete, it's the same thing. It's a permeable material. It's just made out of concrete as opposed to uh, the porous pave, which is made out of uh, recycled tires. But the function is the same. The surfacing, which is only two to three inches thick, is permeable so the water flows right through just like the picture shows and then the key thing is that the base beneath that surfacing is 10 to 12 inches of compacted three quarter inch stone so it's like a big dry well in a way um, but when the water hits the surface it basically flows right through so there is no runoff there's no puddling and um, you know we're not directing it onto the roadway making it either a neighborhood association or the town's stormwater management problem we're keeping the water on the site this is a best management practice that we all need to attain to there are other uh, materials porous uh, or permeable pavers as conservation agent and i will say none of us understood this concept very well um, you know 15 years ago a contractor would come in and say, it's they're permeable. Well, the pavers themselves are not permeable. It's the spaces between them. And if you're laying them on bluestone, crushed bluestone or bluestone dust, there is no permeability. And I can tell you that's the only way people, uh, in years past anyway, when contractors did it. Everybody used crushed stone, uh, bluestone and bluestone dust. So there's a lot of porous, or permeable pavers that are not permeable because they were never installed properly. So likewise, with the percrete and the porous pave, permeable pavers or porous pavers have to be on something that's uh, going to accept the water. So they need to have, you know, 10 inches of, of stone beneath them, but no stone dust. I think, as I recall, back when this, I was here many years ago, I think the parking lot out here, and maybe it's not like that anymore, but they used the, um, the grid system, not the concrete grid system there, but um, I think it was either plastic or something else, which, um, and then they have the gravel on it. So it, it allowed a firm surface to drive on, but still permeable. Um, the concept with the grass, it looks great, like if you weren't using it on a regular basis, but um, I think mm -hmm. that the expectations of having it look like that here in Cape Cod is probably not gonna happen. Um, but if you needed um, a firm area, uh, we have used the concrete grid system up there in Chatham at um, a boat ramp uh, parking area, and it worked really well. So um, it just gave a firm area, but it was filled with gravel. We didn't have vegetation there, but um, it was more permeable than um, maybe some other traditional method. We can harvest rain, we're lucky. Uh, here in the east, we can harvest rain from our roofs. So uh, think about rain barrels. It's another way to manage storm water or to make use of it. Um, we, APCC has partnered with Upcycle Products and you can purchase a rain barrel um, like this red one here that's made out of a repurposed uh, food barrel and APCC gets a little money from it. But it's really kind of a fun way to um, to garden and to kind of get back in touch with what it is to water plants and uh, slow down a little bit. And you can hook a whole bunch of them up together if you really want to go crazy and uh, <laughs> capture it because 55 gallons, it fills up really quick, a 55 gallon uh, barrel. 
And depending on what you're watering, it could last you a while. Um, obviously this last summer, with <laughs> how many weeks and weeks without a drip of rain, um, you probably would have been happier to have more than one barrel. Um, there are some folks that have even put cisterns in. So for people who still want to have a green lawn and be able to water it, um, you know, maybe that's an option. So now I'm just going to recap some of the, the best practices or things to think about. So on the shoreline, avoid trampling vegetation. Think about how delicate that shoreline vegetation is. I remember visiting someone at their property and the woman was so, she lived on a pond and she was so proud of herself that she had this um, nice sandy beach because she methodically went out and weeded. <laughs> Uh, and I, I did not chastise her for it as the conservation agent, but um, she didn't want her grandchildren to step on and have grass. She wanted clean sand, but please don't pull the vegetation on our ponds. Um, you may be pulling out some really important rare species. And storing our boats and all of our recreational toys should be in the upland. You know, think about the vegetation and the critters that use that transitional area. It may be less convenient, but um, it's really the, the better thing to do. Avoid alteration altogether of the shoreline. Um, I know folks want to have those sandy beaches around some ponds and they've brought in sand. That's a really bad idea. I don't think a conservation commission around would really approve that. Um, but I know it's happened <laughs> and um, again, not a good practice. Alteration even with building things. Um, again, I think the, the point of having vegetative buffers and natural shorelines is just really what we should try to attain to. Obviously things have been done over the decades and it's, we're not in a, a totally natural setting, but um, to the extent that we can minimize these things is important and maintaining that natural native vegetative buffer for as wide as you can is great. Angle those paths to the water instead of a straight shot to avoid the erosion. Upgrade your swim float, please. Encourage your neighbors to in a kind way. Report invasive species. Be on the lookout um, for things like Phragmites. That's probably the worst thing around a pond. There clearly are others. <laughs> Ensure your boats are clean and drained and dry before entering and leaving. If you live in a neighborhood association, you may want to put up a sign at your, your community space uh, or boat landing to remind people of that. Don't dump your fish bait. Don't let your niece do it, no matter what she says. Um, yeah, the aquariums, but also the fish bait. It's illegal to dump your fish bait. Boy, I remember as a kid, we always got rid of our earthworms. That's just not a good idea. And then there's other stuff that people use for bait. So don't, um, that shouldn't be done. And here's another idea. Somebody brought this to my attention. We worry about, um, you know, our, our reefs um, and suntan lotion, but maybe suntan lotion and swimming in our ponds. There may be some residual impacts there too to think about. And of course, pick up litter wherever you can. And then in the upland, we want to keep to that stormwater on our property. So look at how, where does your driveway, if you've got a paved driveway, where does that water go? Hopefully it stays on your driveway. If not, there are ways you can fix it. You can put in a trench drain or there may be other options. Um, try to use permeable surfaces when you have to have a hard, uh, when you need to put in a, a parking area, or maybe you've got a, permeable surfaces are also a good way to solve stormwater issues. Maybe you've got a place, maybe your driveway sort of, uh, it doesn't empty onto the roadway, it empties into your garage. Well, maybe you can do a portion of it that's permeable that will intercept that water so it's not um, heading towards your house. Upgrade and maintain your stormwater controls in your neighborhood. I think it's really important, particularly if you're on private roads, avoid using those yard chemicals control invasive species. Um, invasive species, you may be a long way from a pond, but if you've got a, um, something coming up in your yard, it's very likely gonna be able to jump somewhere else. So if you can identify invasive species, it's good to control them. Always plant more native species. We can't have enough. We can't return enough to the wild. 
and trees are so important. Uh, trees help um, intercept the energy from those raindrops and slow it down. Again, we want to slow the rainwater down and let it soak into the ground. And um, trees are absolutely, native trees are extremely important from a habitat standpoint as well. And a whole other host of things. So with that, I've been yakking a lot, um, but there's lots more you can do. If you go to State of the Waters Cape Cod Action Plan, you'll find that at capecodwaters.org. That's one of our um, projects. This is our fourth year of issuing a State of the Waters Cape Cod report. And um, there are lots of good things you can find out there to do um, well beyond what I've um, suggested here this evening to give you some ideas of what you can do to better love your pond. Where to begin? <laughs> nice little notes to a few of my neighbors, I won't say. Yeah. <laughs> Please stop. Um, I know a number of you have said that you live on pond, so maybe you have questions um, for Kristen. And um, uh, I have a question. Once the cyanobacteria starts, um, is there a way to clean it up or stop it or just it just keep on spreading? You know, if we have Cyan a few places. Cyanobacteria is everywhere. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of them. These blooms are something that, um, you know, we, we've become more aware of here in Cape Cod. We, you know, APCC realized that this could be, should be something that we should be keeping an eye on because the rest of the country uh, and uh, Lake Erie, for, isn't another example, are really dealing with us on a, a much um, more frequent basis. So we want to get a handle on it here, and um, not only from a public health and um, standpoint, but also what can we do to, to reduce our nutrient input, which is contributing to it. And um, so once we, you know, it's hard to know if there, if a pond has a bloom, is it going to continue to have a bloom on a regular basis? I don't think we know that. I, I can't say that I know that well enough yet. Um, we haven't, we've only been doing the program for four years, so we don't have our, our local knowledge to, to see a trend in that. Um, clearly there are some examples though. We know in Mashpee they've been dealing, you know, Sam Tewitt's been uh, really bad um, right along. So. You know, there's a, there's a lot we don't know, but there are a lot of people working on it. So um, we're just trying to um, keep on the edge <laughs> of the knowledge. Yeah. yeah how, speaking of San Tua Pond, um, mm -hmm. somebody told me recently that what seemed to help that a couple of years ago was some sort of a device they were using on the pond to keep water moving. Yeah. Was that a myth or did that actually work? No, they, they did. They put solar bees in um, to, um, aerate the water and um, there was some evidence they thought that it helped but clearly Santuit is still suffering um, and sad. I guess what I, what I meant to say was that you know ponds are they're all they're very different we have a lot of different types of ponds and through the freshwater initiative that we're going to be working with the Cape Cod Commission on and we're going to be looking at that more closely but ponds are very complex ecosystems they, you know, I simply brushed over a few characteristics, but they are so complex between the chemistry and the biology. And so to say that there's one thing that's going to fix it and take care of cyano um, from blooming, I, I don't know that there's an answer. A lot of people like to think alum's going to do it, but I don't know that that's always the case um, because alum's not appropriate in all ponds. And, um, so and even if we can treat, it's only temporary. It's a band-aid on the problem. On the, um, so we really need to, again, be looking how we can live more healthy on the land and uh, control our nutrient inputs as best we can. Yes? Yeah, what do you term as a watershed? A watershed. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's the, the area that uh, where the water is going to flow. Um, so the, the Cape Cod Commission has all of the, you can see where your watershed is to your pond. They've got some wonderful information. Um, I don't have the website to, to show you here, but um, you can see where the watershed is to a pond. And so all of that area that um, where water would hit the surface and flow to is generally what a watershed is. 
the surface water flow that enters the pond. Well, if you talk about or town sharing the watershed, mm -hmm. so they must be in some places fairly large. Oh yes, right. yes, yes. Yep. They're all they're all oh. different, but it is all mapped, so you can see it. Um, yes, in the way back. What is the definition of the kettle pond? Um, kettle pond is created by the glaciers. So they, you know, as the glacier moved and sort of gouged out the uh, um, the surface of the landscape as it receded, there were just some really deep areas that got gouged out, and um, they ended up being, uh, for the most part, connected to groundwater. So a lot of our kettle ponds are really deep. We do have isolated wetlands that are more like vernal pools, and they're shallow, but I would still they're kettle holes. Um, they just may not be connected to groundwater. So not all ponds are kettle ponds. Right. I would say that's true, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks. I have a process question. I live on uh, near Deep Pond, and we have a Deep Pond preservation project that's been mm -hmm. quite successful. Yep. Is, it, is this going to be available in some fashion that... Um, that I, I, I'm sure it would be a great thing for the board to, sh to share and uh, it would help them to uh, you know, get the information out to the neighborhood. It'll be on FCTV, but also um, on the 300 committee website oh, okay. with a YouTube link. So, oh, okay, so um, if, you, if you go on to the 300 committee... Yeah, it'll take me a week or two to oh, process okay. it and get it up there, but then it'll be, well, uh, that it'll be, be available great. to anybody who has the link. That would be terrific. You'll edit, edit out all my ums and <laughs> 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 <No> stutters. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was surprised at is that there was no picture of swans or bee geese affecting ponds. Mm. You're right. Waterfowl can be can really foul. Um, water quality. Um, we have a pond in Chatham where someone insists on feeding the geese, and um, and it also happens to be a stopover. Um, for gulls. When we had a, the landfill, they would come from North Beach, from the Barrier Beach. The gulls would come and they'd go into the freshwater pond, and this is where the woman was also feeding the other birds before they headed over to the dump. <laughs> um, but yes, they, they can obviously, there's a lot of nutrients being. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, swans, swans are not native. You know, we don't want to encourage them. <laughs> And the geese, of course, don't go home anymore. They stay here all the time. So feeding, yeah. if your town, it's really good for your board of health to have a, a bylaw that um, discourages people from feeding, encouraging. Well, I have a question about boats and cleaning. Is there any particular uh, type of, you know, what do you use to clean? I mean, if it was Clorox then maybe that's not so good. It, it's really about taking a close look and making sure there's nothing, no little piece of vegetation hanging in something in a nook and cranny, or heaven forbid you, like if you had a boat somewhere in the Finger Lakes where we have zebra mussels in upstate New York, um, if your boat was in the water for a long time or your gear or something, you know, you wouldn't want to then suddenly move it somewhere else without having <clears throat> checked it out thoroughly. So it's not so much about, you know, moving bacteria or something like that. It's really looking at plants and uh, other critters that might be hiding in. Uh, so you always want to make sure your drain is drained well. Mm -hmm. Well, what an interesting evening. <laughs> <laughs> and lucky to all of you who live on ponds. <laughs> Go to your associations, I guess. <laughs> Going, thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. it was, I will say, I will say, I do get the um, APCC newsletters, and one of the things they thought was a great idea, which I'm all for it, is a water barrel, a red water barrel, barrel for a Valentine. Day. So, right on the website, you can order your rain barrels if you want a red one for Valentine's Day. Thank you. And please take cookies and 